This is Jason Lavalley from Psychedelic Scene, and I'm speaking with Tim DeLauder of the Polyphonic Spree, who have a new album out called Salvage Enterprise. Tim, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. You've uh, mentioned that the new album Salvage Enterprise is a Rising from the Ashes record. What does that mean exactly? Because as far as I know, you've never burnt to the ground. <laughs> well, for all you know, I haven't. Um... Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, things that happen behind the scenes that people don't really know about, you know, they just kind of go off your work that's out there, but they don't really know the, what's going on, you know, behind all that. Sure. And uh, I was going through a really difficult time, um, in that period. And, uh, for me, it felt like rising from the ashes. And because um, I thought I was never going to be able to write a song again, that's the frame of mind I was in. So um, it was uh, a bit of a debilitating time. And so that's kind of what I mean by that. I was kind of spiritually broken at the time and thought I was like done. And um, lo and behold, you're never done when you're alive. So when you're a human being and I always um, you forget that sometimes, but um even though you know it, but, um, um, it took, uh, you know, the muse of songwriting and, um, finding and finding yourself and stumbling onto it. And lo and behold, there it is. And you end up kind of saving yourself all over again. So, um, that's what I mean by that. Okay. And, and yeah, I mean, what your experience seems to reflect a, a lot of people's experience over the last few years. A lot of people have been going through hard times and coming to spiritual crises and so forth. Um, well, thanks for explaining that. Yeah. I, I noticed that on the new album, there are a bunch of sections, which is a, u a unique approach to take. And that you begin with, uh, I mean, all the songs have a title, but they also each have a section number. And the section number begins with 44. And I'm wondering, why 44? Well, if you'd followed the spree from the very beginning, um, it started off with section one. So each album has sections. The songs are, are referred to as sections. Because when I was first putting the band together, when we were putting this body of music together to play a show, I was always referring to them as sections and not really titles of songs. Um, it was just, we're, you know, we're going from this section to this section and it was like a body of work. And, um, that was, uh, just to play a show because initially the whole idea of the spree, um, I was writing songs, but it was also like, um, I was putting together songs for a show because I was kind of being, you know, pushed, you need to get something going. I thought, well, I want to put this band together that I've always thought about and, and um, and I've created this body of work as a, for a show, and um, we didn't even have a record yet. We were playing the show, but the songs that we put to, that I put together for the uh, um, show ultimately became our first record, which was the beginning stages of the Polyphonic Spree. And so, like I said, if, if you start at the beginning, each record has those sections in parentheses. So that that's the reason why it's the 44th song um, of the Polyphonic Spree. Okay, well that makes total sense now. Um, for some reason, well n I didn't really think this, but I I recently did uh, a piece on the first album by uh, Country Joe and the Fish, and on that album there's a song called Section 43. I'm like, huh, mm -hmm. that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's no deep meaning behind it other than we thought, you know, uh, why not continue the sections and people, if they become a Spree fan, in order to get all the records, they can have all the chronological order of the sections of the Polyphonic Spree. Okay, cool. Um, I know that you have Mark Pirro, who played bass with you in Tripping Daisy in your band now. Uh, but I was wondering if, if you have the same group of musicians that you've had on previous albums and tours, or if you, you know, change it up all the time? Well, it's been 23 years of the spree. 
And yeah, we've been through a lot of members since then. It's over a hundred, at least over a hundred. Um, but Mark Pirro is still in the band. Brian Wakeland um, was playing drums in the spree. He's uh, he's kind of an alternative drummer when Jason can't make it. Um, there's a lot of members that have been there from the previous album, which was Yes, It's True. Um, but from the beginning, it's really a few people. It's myself, Mark, Brian on and off, Jennifer Job, who's the opera singer that was with us from the beginning. She's still in the band. You hear her on this latest record. And I believe that's probably it from the very beginning group. Um, the rest have gone off to do other bands or start families or have moved on. Yeah. Do you, do you have auditions? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, at the beginning it was, um, I was, you know, I didn't know any people in the symphonic world. So I was just kind of getting whoever could play. I would mm -hmm. pick, pick people up at the mall that were playing for people in the malls. I would just like, Hey man, can you improvise and be a part of this? It's uh, I just didn't know, but now after twenty over twenty years of doing it, I've, I've really got an amazing um, selection to choose from, and it's the musicianship seems to continue to go up in value um, the longer we've been together because there's more people that are um, familiar with the spree that actually want to be a part of it, and um, so I get a lot of people like that, and then there's people that. Are, right, North Texas, and, you know, the audition consists of just kind of coming in and improvising. That's the only prerequisite. You have to be able to improvise um, on your instrument and um, kind of have the spirit for what we're all about mm -hmm. and, um, and, and be able to put up with a band with that many people in it. It's really not that difficult, you know. Right, so uh, how many people are in the band now? Uh, there's 20, 20, Two of us. Wow. How how do you keep everybody happy? Um, well, they all have lives outside of the spree. They all have um jobs, gigs, they teach. Um I just hopefully the music keeps them happy and interested in doing it. Um we play a lot of one offs, but now that we just released this record, we're gonna be gearing up and going on tour. So there's going to be some folks that can't make it, which means I'll have to like start finding some folks who can go out on the road. But um, I don't know. I guess you just kind of keep the music interesting and, and hopefully people are are into it. And so far they have been. So it's, it's you know, um, it's really expensive for the band to tour. So it's not yeah. like we're out playing all the time because we just can't. It's just the nature of the beast. And so but the downtime between records is what's kind of tough, but we do these one-offs to keep it interesting, keep people on board. But, um, I don't know. They, they seem to be into it. I've never had a problem with keeping people. It's just that the time between records is what gets kind of difficult and just the longevity of a band, you know? Sure. Uh, you mentioned that you've had hundreds of people in the band, which I'm thinking must be a record. You know, there there are certain bands like the Soft Machine and the Fall who've had dozens of members in their bands, but uh, yeah, you might hold the record. Well, when you got a band that's got you know probably five bands in one, um, you know, we first started off there were thirty people in the band. Um, it's kind of like in over twenty three years, that's a large number of people to have in a group for that long time. So it's not that difficult to, to reach that number over a hundred people that have been in a band for that for over 23 years. Um, I'd be this, you know, be pretty disturbing if it was a five piece band that had over a hundred people leaving the band, but yeah. with the spree that has, you know, 20 something people in it. Um, it's, I, I, it's kind of a feat that it hasn't been more than that, but usually, you know, we have people that kind of stick with us, you know, between six to 10 years, kind of on average. Um, and then you just kind of have people that, you know, maybe they come in for a few and they can't do it anymore. And then you kind of end up moving on. But over 23 years, I think we've been pretty, pretty lucky to keep the people we've kept. Sure. 
Uh, I understand that you may be promoting the album by playing in planetariums across the country. Is, is that coming yeah. together? So, yeah, um, I in order to spread the word about this record, because I wanted people to hear this record as a whole, um, I was doing the uh, I was doing listening experiences where I just had a sprinter van and 12 speaker QSC speakers. Um, QVC speakers and then a um, um, couple of generators and I just kind of head out and did pop-up listening experiences where I'd say hey I'm going to be at this location at this time come on out it's free you know and I'd set these up in a circle and I had moving blankets and people would lay down in the center of the circle and um, listen to the record for 43 minutes so um that was wildly successful and people loved it. Um, and I'm still doing them, but I thought, you know, what if I could, you know, bring this indoors in an area to where they could kick back, look at the stars, but also we could create a film to the record where they listen to the record from start to finish. And so we came up with the concept, which we've been working on with different uh, animators from all over the world that are making pieces per song and then it'll be made into a full film which will um show in planetariums and yeah. that'll be in in may but but will you be performing live in the planetariums too no this is just going to be on some we'll play like the opening of it in certain regions and then it's just going to be its own film that plays with the uh, soundtrack of the spree okay Cool. And also uh, that whole um, live listening experience that you just described is really a, a novel idea. And uh, uh, that, that's great to hear that it was wildly successful. I don't yeah, know anybody it was, else who did that. It was, um, you know, it all started because I wanted people to hear it as a whole. And today we're so conditioned to just go from song to song. We have a jukebox in our par in our pockets, and I just it was annoying to me that there wasn't you know more uh, people listening to albums anymore. Like kind of like we did when we were younger. You go buy an album, first thing you did was go and play the whole thing and like just zone out with it. And and I kind of wanted this album is that kind of album, and I wanted people to experience it like that. So I I I really struggled with even releasing the record. I sat on this record for almost two years before even releasing it because I was like so perplexed, like how can I get people to hear this thing? And then um, I was sharing the record with my friends and we're out on some land and I was playing it at a campfire on a Bluetooth speaker and we're just laying out under the stars listening to the record. And they were like, dude, this is amazing. And I was like, wow, fuck, maybe I should just just do this. And like, I can get my own sound system and I can get generators and I'll just, I'll just drive out there and find spots and just do it. And it was more of a guerrilla style effort. I, um, I didn't get permission. I, I tried to do it the right way first and it turned into just total bureaucratic mess and expensive. So then I just kind of had to renegade it and just do it. And then I'd find, I'd find like rural land and, and go out and do it on it. And then, um, then I started doing it in parks and at beaches. And then, then people would say, Hey, I've got a friend that's got some land. You can do it out here. Or, I've got a friend that's got a, a property that, you know, they're starting to, you know, they're not having started building on it yet, but he owns it. You can go do it there and just started doing it like that. And then just finding areas where I thought I could get away with it. And then I would just tweet and um, tweet out there. Hey, I'm going to be at there at this spot at this time. If you're in the area, come on out, you know, and it was anywhere from 10 to probably 75 people that would show up because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm limited to whoever's in my, my social media web um, and that are located in that specific area at that specific time. So it was nothing that I could set up. This is something that was literally done within a four hour period. I just would drive around and like, okay, this looks like a good spot. I've checked all the boxes of what I thought would make it work and I could get away with it. And then I'd go for it and set it up. And it'd take me about two and a half hours to set it up by myself. And, um, 
and then I'll just put, blast it out there and see who would show up. You just never knew. And then you also never knew how people were going to take the record, which was also kind of interesting, um, how people would use that time for themselves, the space, um, you know, just getting people to, like, tune out and tune into this um, was something I wasn't even really thinking about. I'm thinking about, hey, man, I want you to hear this record from start to finish, but also it's like, you know, the grind of life and the chaos that we're all dealing with, just unplugging from that and being in this this required environment, which is outside, looking at the stars and um, turning your phone off to that, um, that was its own thing that I wasn't really thinking it was going to be the benefits of that. But, you know, people started doing yoga. People were really emotional. Um, it was... Uh, I don't know. It was every listening experience was different. And um, I really enjoyed doing it. You know, uh, it was it was super cool. I did it for a month and a half until I ran out of money and then um, came back home. And I thought, well, um, I, I need to get this record out here because people keep asking me about it. This listening experience, like the only way you could hear it is if you came to the listening experience. Um and so I finally got the nerve up to go ahead and, and put the thing out. And uh, so here we go. But still, I I still enjoy doing I've done them since then. And I'm probably going to do another tour of them um, again because just people enjoy it. Yeah, it sounds like a little, uh, you're inviting people to step outside their normal reality. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, and, and it's like, and give you permission to do that. And it's free. It just it just takes the energy for you to just to go to that spot, turn your phone off, and lay down in a circle. And and that's another thing. The way that I had the sound system set up, it was like being outside with headphones on, but no headphones on. And that's a weird feeling in itself. But the sound was amazing. Um, and so that that's an experience in itself. So I don't know. There was a lot of things that came out about that that um, was all birthed in the idea of wanting people to hear it from start to finish. But it turned out that it, it meant a lot more than just that. It was fascinating. Yeah. Well, the, the music of the polyphonic spree, like Tripping Daisy, is often categorized as neo-psychedelic. And I'm wondering to what extent uh the psychedelic experience is factored into your music making um i've always i've always been drawn to it um even since i was younger i was into prog as a kid um i you know i i find you know i find elevator music to be psychedelic <laughs> in a sense um uh and drugs you know I, i've experimented and i've had my my time with that and um I, don't, I certainly don't use it to to write you know um but uh i appreciate the um the journey that one can take and um i like to think that my music does that and I like the experience of a journey, and it may seem more proggy, uh, more than experimental um, at times, um, but I think it kind of floats in the lines of, of being um, um, prog and experimental, psychedelic. Okay. What was it? Well, you guys, the Polyphonic Spree opened for David Bowie on the reality tour. And I was just wondering what you could tell me about that experience. Um, wow. Well, it was amazing. Um, night after night, uh, you know, he, David was a, a big supporter of the band from the very beginning. He brought us out to, um, he got us out of Texas. Uh, the, the band had never left outside the the state, and this was in 2002. Um, he got a copy of Beginning Stages of and asked us to come 
play a festival he was curating at the Royal Festival Hall in London. And, um, of course, we said yes, and then we had to get everybody over there, which was a feat in itself. But he's the one that kind of brought us over, and that show in particular pretty much catapulted the band into a frenzy over there, and we ended up spending the next four years of our lives touring the U.K. and Europe and all because of that particular show. Um, it just kind of, the band took off, so we just basically stayed over there, and, um, you know, we lived over there, but it was because of him. And then we played another festival that he curated um, later, the Highline Festival. Um, but when he was doing his last tour, he asked us if we would open up for him. And, of course, we jumped at it, and it was amazing. You know, it got to the point where we really just hit it off with him. I don't – he really loved the band. He was very, very uh, kind and open with us, with me. He would talk to me regularly, pull me to the side, how's everything going, and ask about the songs. And um, he would, you know, on a nightly basis, he would go out and costume, like wear a wig and a hat and go out and watch the band. And he'd always be at our, at our um, sound checks. And he was just a real fan of the group. And... Um, kind of like a quarter way into the, the, uh, tour, he pulled me to the side. He said, I've got a song I want you to sing with me on. And, uh, I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, what do you mean sing with you on? But he wanted me to do this duet with him on Slip Away. And so, uh, he had it all figured out what he wanted me to do, how he wanted me to enter the stage come across the catwalk, um, how I'd come down, where I would land, finish and sing. And I'm singing back and forth with him. And then we meet at the, at the front of the stage where he's playing a stylophone and we finish the song together. We ended up doing that on a nightly basis for the rest of the tour. And it went so well that he tried to extend our time with him. Um, but unfortunately, there were other bands that, that were already obligated um, but shortly after we split up, literally two, two and a half weeks later, um, he had some health issues happen and the, the tour was over. So, um, I don't know. It was, it was an awesome experience because we were doing a Bowie cover, um, prior to any of this, um, and fan, being a fan, it was, it was amazing. And it, to, to find that he was so uh, open and real, down to earth, very uh, sincere, um, super uh, thoughtful. My God, he came on the bus one night and uh, he goes, "Well, I got you. What did you guys some pizzas and stuff? I guess figured you were hungry." He would just do stuff like that, just very one on one. I've played big with big bands before, and you know the the actual artists are, they're not as uh, approachable mm -hmm. where he was just constantly in our world and very much approachable and very uh, um, accommodating and never made me feel weird or anything. It was just a very, very genuine person, oh, wow. uh, which made that experience so much more amazing. That's great to hear. Yeah. Well, you're going to be starring in a new film called El Tonto Por Cristo. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, 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 uh, I play Gabriel, um, an angel in this, and um, it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a Josh David Jordan film. Uh, it's all in black and white, and it's about the Orthodox Church, and it's a fool for Christ is what that translates to, and it's about this particular father's journey. Um, through um, the church, the process, and I play Gabriel. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> so is it a pretty big role? No, I mean, I, it's an independent film. This is during, you know, during the strike when there's, you're going to see a lot of great independent films pop up here in the next year or so because a lot of the uh, 
a lot of actors weren't able to do big budget films. And so you have an enormous amount of independent films that were made. We just haven't seen them yet, but it's going to be in the, in the breadth of that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't want to give too much away. I don't, it's not a very big role, but I'm throughout the whole film. Um, but it's just, I play an angel. That's pretty much all I can say. Okay. All right. Well, the new album is out now. It's called Salvage Enterprise. And uh, Tim, I want to thank you again for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate it. You bet. Have a wonderful sorry day. About my, <laughs> sorry about my phone overheating. Yeah, no worries. That kind of thing happens. All right. All right. Thanks so much. You bet. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.